Hi there, everybody. This is our lecture on logical fallacies, and you can read a lot more about logical fallacies. There's good background information in the eighth chapter of the Little Brown Handbook, so be sure and review there. Um, but be sure that you also don't skip parts of this lecture because there are additional fallacies that I think are important for you to know about that are not included in the text. And so all of these are explored here. Uh, I will also post this series of PowerPoint slides so that you can download those, you can print those out if you want, you can even take notes on those depending on your printing settings. And so that might be a handy reference for you beyond the, the audio in this presentation. So. The first fallacy, actually, let me back up. Before we get into that, I want to just provide a little bit of framework for logical fallacies. So a logical fallacy is um, a weak pattern of reasoning or um, a, a pattern of reasoning that's not backed by factual, verified, credible information. Some of these fallacies are also sort of deflection points. So when you're in an argument with someone, if you don't have facts that can back up what you're saying, you might use a logical fallacy as more of a defense mechanism. And so I'll point those out. It's important to mention that logical fallacies, just because you use a logical fallacy, doesn't mean that you are wrong. Um, a logical fallacy doesn't have to necessarily be untrue. It might be correct, um, but there are sort of some logical leaps that we're making, some inferences that we're making, um, or some, some facts and data that aren't verifying what we're saying. But that doesn't mean that we're wrong. It doesn't mean that when someone uses a logical fallacy that the other person identifying that in an argument is automatically correct. It, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, logical fallacies are things that if you can recall watching political debates, you will see logical fallacies used there all the time. Um, lots of political discussions are really laden with logical fallacies. Um, your family dinner table, if you gather together for Thanksgiving and, and unpleasant uh, conversations come up, you're likely to see logical fallacies emerge there. And so as we go through some of these examples, and by the way, the examples that I'm listing are, are just random examples. They um, may be untrue, they may be true, they may be um, sort of on one side of a political ideology, they may be on another. I am only using them here as examples. I'm not standing behind any of, of what I'm saying. I'm only using these examples to demonstrate the fallacies themselves. And I want to just say that up front. So um, don't, don't think that I believe these things, that I endorse these things. I'm just using them as examples. So our first fallacy is begging the question. And when we use this fallacy, we are saying something suggesting that something is true, but it's actually not yet proven. It's not yet been proven to be truthful. So here are two examples. Um, the first, Hillary Clinton will definitely win the election. Trump won't ever receive the full support of the GOP. And if you follow news closely, this is probably something that definitely could have been um, uttered by someone on, um, on network news. And, and we know how that turned out. A lot of people thought that Hillary Clinton would definitely win the election, that Trump would never receive the support of the GOP or be able to um, be, be an elected presidential candidate. And yet here we are. And so that's an example of begging the question. Another example of that would be someone saying, oh, everyone knows that we are all Christians, making an assumption. Uh, it, it may be true. Everyone in that space or that room uh, where this suggestion is being made, maybe they are all Christians, but unless you have information to verify the truthfulness of that statement, you're using the fallacy of begging the question. A non sequitur. And a lot of these um, funny names, especially for logical fallacies um, are derived from Latin. So here, non sequitur is the Latin for it does not follow. And so that's a good way to remember what a non sequitur is. It means that there's really no logical connection between two or more ideas. You're suggesting that two things are connected that really don't have um, a, a solidified relationship. So two examples to demonstrate that. The first well, just look at the size of this administration building. It is obvious the university does not need more funding. So we have two things that we are unfairly perhaps correlating. There may not be a relationship. It may not follow that because a college has an administration building that is impressive in size, that that should mean that we can infer that the university is in a strong financial position. So just because one thing exists doesn't mean that it's connected with this other idea. Another example, 
Aunt Jane's face looks a lot less wrinkly. I bet she got a facelift while she was in Sonoma. So there isn't a logical connection uh, between these ideas. Now, that does not mean, just like I said about logical fallacies in general, that just because we say these things, that they can't be true. If we go back to the first example about the administration building, it, it could absolutely still be true that the administration building is impressive and also that the university does not need more funding, that the university um, has, has an impressive endowment, that the university has no level of, of financial trouble or difficulty. In a similar vein, we could have um, Aunt Jane, maybe, maybe she really did get a facelift when she was in Sonoma and that's why she's wrestling she is less wrinkly. So there are lots of things that could connect these things, but a non sequitur um, identifies the fact that there really isn't a logical connection between two or more ideas that we suggest are connected. That's a non sequitur. A straw man. In some ways, a straw man is sort of a, a defensive posture. It's, um, it's used in response to an argument. So if you are arguing with someone and you don't have a good response that really logically um, responds to someone's idea or accusation or, um, or proposal and you disagree with it, a straw man is sort of a deflective tactic, okay? And when we use a straw man logical fallacy, what we're really doing is sort of distorting. We're exaggerating. A position and that gets um, particularly if we have an audience that's a way to sort of move the conversation in a different direction that's a way to make what that person is suggesting seem um, illogical dirty ill-advised all those sorts of things we do that when we use straw man fallacy so as examples Oh, you think we should uh, we should agree to cut into our own salaries? Why do you want to bleed us dry? It's the bleed us dry part that makes this statement uh, a demonstration of a straw man fallacy. Okay, so there's there's that distortion and exaggeration. Maybe this is a response to someone that um, I don't know. Say you work for a religiously affiliated organization. And there's a suggestion that comes up that um, to make to make expenses, we need to um, increase the percentage that we tithe. We need to move from 10% to 12%. And you don't like that idea. This could be um, a deflection if you don't have a logical argument that responds to that. And instead, you sort of distort or exaggerate what their original suggestion was. Instead of that original suggestion being, let's increase our, um, our giving percentages by 2%, moving from 10 to 12, you respond by saying, why do you want to bleed us dry? So that's one example. Another would be um, a bride saying to mom and dad, I can't believe you think a $12,000 budget for wedding flowers is unreasonable. Would you rather Derek and I eloped? So here again, we have that distortion and exaggerated position. So we take someone uh, whose parents who are, we, we assume paying for a wedding, uh, who say, you know, do you really think that $12,000 for just, just for flowers, do you think that we could pare that down a little bit? The response uses straw man by saying, you know, I can't believe that you think that's unreasonable. Of course it's reasonable. And you know what, on that line, would you rather that I just eloped? It's distorting and exaggerating the position of the opposition. That's straw man. A red herring uh, in similar fashion is also sort of a deflection tactic. And it's when we introduce a, an irrelevant issue or a new piece of attention or a new piece of evidence, and we use that to divert attention. And this is really particularly effective. Um, you'll see it a lot. Um, it's kind of synonymous with spinning. <laughs> if you ever hear uh, people in heated television interviews or people on the radio who are asked questions and they just kind of deflect a little bit or they try to change the subject, that exemplifies um, the use of red herring. So here's a good example. Someone's asked something about, um, I don't know, speculation that they're having an affair, or that they're getting divorced. This is a public figure. And that person might respond by saying, you know, why do you have to question my private life uh, when there are real social problems that we need to deal with? So that is the attempt of someone to 
move the conversation into a new direction, to divert attention from this subject that they don't want to talk about, whether that's speculation about an affair or a policy that they're being questioned about, something that they don't want to talk about. Instead of addressing that and, and, and talking about that specifically, they sort of try and pivot the conversation. That's what a red herring is. False authority is fairly self-evident. We use this fallacy when we cite as evidence the opinions of people who may or may not really be um, actual authorities. So because we haven't clarified that person's specific knowledge or expertise on that subject, we really can't be certain that what they say is credible. As examples, my uncle served in World War II, and he knows that women can't handle combat. Well, we don't know enough about your uncle's background, his level of expertise, his own specific experience to say that his assertion that women can't handle combat is, is credible, uh, is trustworthy. We don't have enough information. And just saying that um, based on his tenure of service in World War II, that limited information that we get, it doesn't give us enough information to establish his expertise, his authority on the subject. Another example, my grandma always just sprays Windex on flesh wounds. She says it's safe and effective. So um, old wives tales definitely fall under false authority. Um, if you ever have people who uh, talk about ways to instantly cure hangovers, <laughs> maybe these are people who are speaking from experience uh, or people who say that in their experience, this has always worked out well, um, but, but they don't have actual credibility or authority to make suggestions uh, that, that we would generally consider trustworthy. That's an example of false authority. Bandwagon, uh, which is also known as ad populum, that's the Latin for argument to, uh, to popularity. Here we're trying to sort of use a, um, a social norming approach. We're arguing that something is valid because most people accept it as valid. Um, you imply that rightly or wrongly, everyone believes this. You're, you're trying to sort of peer pressure uh, your opposition into agreeing with you by saying, you know, most people find that this is reasonable. You'll see this in commercials. If you have um, people who are talking about a skin cream and 94% of women said that their skin texture was firmer after three weeks of use, whatever. They're, they're also making an appeal to popularity. Um, as other examples, everybody knows that community college courses are easier than four-year colleges. So if I'm trying to get you to believe that community college courses are easier than four-year college courses, that everybody knows phrase, that is what makes uh, this a bandwagon or an ad populum approach. You'll probably see um, billboards and um, local focus groups or polls that are taken specifically for um, drug and tobacco use behaviors, particularly among teens and high school students. You'll see this kind of information floating around uh, pretty regularly. So as an example, 72% of Adams County teens have never tried smoking marijuana. So what they're trying to argue here informally is that if 72% of people are doing this, why would you want to be a part of the 28% who are? So they're trying to make this appeal of popularity that you should side with these 72% of people because it's easier to be in the majority of people than, than in the minority. So a lot of public opinion poll results are, um, are falling within this fallacy, depending on how that poll data is framed and how it's being used. Ad hominem, here's more Latin. Um, ad hominem is argument to the man or argument to the person. And this is where, in response to someone's ideas or suggestions, rather than responding to that idea or their argument, instead we attack the speaker, the person who is making the argument. So if someone is saying that, you know, we need to approve this new policy, you don't actually respond by talking about the policy itself and the flaws of the policy or what you disagree uh, with with regard to the policy. Instead, you attack the person who's proposing the policy changes. As examples, 
you are an idiot if you believe that campaign finance reform would result in any real change. So this is someone who's responding to an argument on campaign finance reform. But instead of actually responding to that idea, that argument specifically relating to campaign finance reform, instead they're just attacking the person making that argument. It's a personal attack. As a second example, we can't believe anything he says. He is a convicted felon. So you're trying to attack the credibility of that person and undermine their argument. But what would be more logically sound would be to actually look at the idea, the suggestion, the argument that the other person is making and to directly, logically, rationally break that down and identify opposition there. But instead, um, ad hominem is an argument to the person, to the man, it's a personal attack ad hominem tu quo qui is an extension of a personal attack. So the tu quo qui part really introduces this concept of hypocrisy. So it's the same thing as an ad hominem attack, except it has a more specific context. An ad hominem attack is just a personal attack of a general nature. So an ad hominem tu quo qui um, is when we also accuse that person in that personal attack of being hypocritical of what they're arguing, okay? So here are some examples that demonstrate this well. Pastor, how can you preach about family values when you cheated on your wife, okay? So you can see how there's both the accusation of a personal attack, and the personal attack is saying that the person making an argument, in this case the pastor, is a hypocrite. I, you are not a credible person to tell me about family values. You cheated on your wife. You are not a credible person to speak or argue on this position. Okay, that's the two quo qui part. It, the two quo qui part needs to involve um, hypocrisy in a personal attack. Here's another example. Jerry, how can you lecture me about not eating well when I just saw you in the drive-thru at KFC? So you can see how these are extensions of a, of a traditional ad hominem attack. These have a, um, a more pronounced and specific relationship to an accusation of hypocrisy as they attack the speaker, the person making an argument. Moving on to a hasty generalization. This is covered in the text. And when we make a hasty generalization, we jump to a conclusion with little or no evidence, okay? So we're making a logical leap. We're saying that um, if this is happening, then, then this is definitely happening. Uh, we don't have enough information actually to really verify the relationship between those two. But again, it may not mean that we are wrong. It means that we're just not providing all of the logical, factual framework to say that it's so. But it doesn't mean that that's not true. As examples, her child was running around screaming and kicking. He should be on Ritalin. So we're making, we're jumping to a conclusion without having real clinical evidence. We don't know why the child was running around kicking and screaming. This person is making sort of a logical leap that the reason why the child is screaming and kicking is that the child is not medicated and should be medicated and that medication that they should be given should specifically be Ritalin, okay? So those are those logical leaps that we're making in that example, all right? As another example, we have children for whom screen time is not monitored are more difficult to discipline. So again, we're sort of just generalizing that this is a conclusion we can make, but we don't have any real evidence that supports it, at least not in that statement. A sweeping generalization generally connects with stereotyping. And this is easier to spot because we see phrases that um, relate to things always happening, never happening, attitudes or behaviors that all people do. And it, if these are really easy to defeat in terms of an argumentative stance. When we make sweeping generalizations and we say that something is always this way, or all people do this, all people believe this, all people hate this, whatever it is, all we have to do is find one exception and it knocks down that entire argument. So the way to get around a sweeping generalization is to back off of that 
hard phrasing that this is always this way, that everyone thinks this, that it is never the case that blah, blah, blah. If we can soften the phrasing by qualifying statements, instead of saying always, we could say in many cases, in most cases, many people instead of all people or everyone or everybody. So softening the phrasing can help us to move around a sweeping generalization. But good examples are rednecks always drive trucks and drink moonshine, okay? And again, you can see how there's a link with stereotyping here. We could say things like rednecks like to drive trucks and moonshine, or some rednecks like to drive trucks and drink moonshine. I don't, there are ways to sort of backpedal off of the, um, the strong phrasing there. A second example, everyone in Arkansas is Baptist, okay? So maybe many people in Arkansas are Baptist, but if I'm responding to someone who's making this statement, all I have to do is find one person in Arkansas who is not Baptist. Maybe I find someone who's Pentecostal. Maybe I find someone who's Roman Catholic or someone who's Jewish or someone who's not religious. And, and then I've sort of defeated their entire argument because your entire argument is that every single person in Arkansas is Baptist. All I have to do is find one exception to defeat that argument. All right, post hoc, ergo propter hoc. You'll see in a lot of cases that this is truncated, uh, the name of this fallacy to just post hoc. So if you see it as post hoc, it's the same thing as post hoc, ergo propter hoc. And I, I listed the full title because it connects with the Latin. Uh, the Latin for this fallacy is after this, therefore because of this. So the best way to remember post hoc ergo propter hoc is confusion of cause and effect. Um, if you are a superstitious person, um, if you are an athlete and you have a lucky pair of socks or you have like a, a thing that you like to wear because you feel like it brings you good luck, this is an example. These are examples, um, behaviors that demonstrate post hoc as a fallacy. We have two things that are happening closely together in time, but we draw a conclusion that the first event led to the second event. Okay, so again, we have a confusion of cause and effect. So as an example, after my child received his vaccination for polio, he developed autism. Autism is caused by vaccinations. So here we see two things that are happening closely together. The first event was a vaccination and the second event was a diagnosis of autism. And we claim that the first event led to or caused the second event. Now this may be true, maybe it is true. We don't know, we don't have enough information uh, in this example to say that this is true or untrue, but we are confusing these two events. Just because one thing happened before a second thing doesn't mean that the first event triggered or caused the second. Here's another example, and this relates again to, like I said, the, uh, the superstitious sort of behaviors that we sometimes uh, think about. The, if I step on a crack on the sidewalk, then I will break my mother's back. That's an example of post hoc. Again, we have another example that every time Sheila goes to a game with us, our team loses. She is bad luck. So if you have Sheila who goes to home games, and when she goes, your team always loses. You're correlating the fact that Sheila going to this game caused your team to lose. Okay, so that's post hoc, ergo propter hoc. Either or, or black white fallacy, just like bandwagon and ad populum are sort of interchangeable. They're, they're the same fallacy. Either or and black white are, are describing the same fallacy. And in these cases, we're presenting only two options. And we're declaring that one of them is correct and the other one is incorrect. There's no gray area. There's no other options. It's this or this. One is right. One is wrong. One is good. One is bad. So as examples. If gays aren't allowed to adopt children, those children will languish in foster care. So if this is someone who's making an argument that we need to, uh, we need to stand behind gay couples who would like to adopt children who are in the foster care system, and we make this argument, we're saying that unless gay couples are allowed to adopt these children, no one will adopt these children. But if we think about that, um, that may not be the most, the most, uh, excellent argument to make to support that cause because what are other options? You can think of other options. We could have other people who are not gay couples 
or gay individuals who are adopting children in foster care. Those children may not necessarily languish in foster care. So we can see that we really don't have just those two options. More of those options exist. As another example, we either raise tuition or massively increase class size. So say you are an administrator at a college or university and your retention rates have dipped and you need to think of uh, a way to keep your budget moving forward um, without going into debt or drawing on your endowment. And so here we have just two choices and one is right and one is wrong. So maybe you're saying that I think we need to raise tuition for next year. That's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna stay financially fit. So you say we either raise tuition or we massively increase class size. And that's the, that's the wrong thing. There's a right decision and a wrong decision and only two choices. But we can think of lots of different things that might be done outside of just these two options that would satisfy the problem at hand. We could slightly raise tuition and slightly increase class size. We could, um, we could change up the way that we recruit students. We could uh, increase fundraising efforts. We could do a lot of different things that would solve that problem. So those demonstrate sort of the, the problematic approach of this either or kind of logic, this black and white thinking. All right. Here's a skewed sample, which is the same as Texas Sharpshooter. I, I think I most commonly refer to this fallacy as Texas Sharpshooter. And I like that because there's an analogy that goes along with that, and it makes this easy to remember. Um, imagine yourself as, um, as a big Texan rancher, okay? So think of yourself as having the boots and, uh, and the Wrangler jeans and big old cowboy hat, and you're, and you're on your ranch, and you're walking around, and you're walking next to your big barn on your ranch, okay? And you pull out a couple of pistols and you fire them in succession, just bang, 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 into the side of your barn. And then you walk into the barn and you grab a can of paint and then you draw a target where you've just shot into the side of your barn. So, and, th and that demonstrates this this fallacy it's what we do where we have a specific result that we want the texas sharpshooter wanted to look like a really good shot but he shot first and then formed the target around where he shot so he controlled where the target ended up and how big it was and it made it look like those shots in the side of the barn were more accurate than the then perhaps they would have been, had the target been there from the very beginning, all right? So this is a pretty common problem with scientific studies because we have people that have a specific result that they want to get. Um, it's kind of like a sampling bias, all right? And we're saying that two events are correlated and that one caused the other, okay? So there's sort of like a, a causation problem with the logic that, that we infer when we're having um, a skewed sample. So as an example, based on a survey of 1,000 American homeowners, 99% of those surveyed have two or more automobiles worth on average $100,000 each. Therefore, Americans are very wealthy, okay? So this, this is an actual sample. These are 1,000 American homeowners and 99%, so 900, um, 990 of these American homeowners confirmed that they own at least two automobiles and at least two of their automobiles are worth at least $100,000 each. And so we've drawn this conclusion that Americans are wealthy. The problem is the sample. <laughs> We've sampled only homeowners living in Beverly Hills, California, all right? So those are sample results that are actual. The problem is it's not really typical. Um, these are not typical results of um, all Americans. We, we've selected a sample strategically to get the result that we wanted. We wanted to be able to say that Americans are very wealthy. So to conduct a survey, we specifically chose Beverly Hills, California, knowing that we would get this type of a response. That's a demonstration of Texas sharpshooter or skewed sample. 
Slippery slope um, is probably one that you've seen before, and it assumes that once an action begins, it sort of sets off this trigger of eventual and inevitable things that will follow. So, as examples, if we let the government dictate where we can pray, soon the government will tell us that we cannot pray at all, all right? Another example, if more gun safety laws are introduced, eventually we won't even be able to own guns. So. It's sort of, um, it's saying, I can't stand behind this because then if, I, if this happens, then all of these other things will happen um, after it. It's sort of gonna open this floodgate of, of negative unintended consequences. That's what happens when people argue based on slippery slope. It doesn't mean that it's not true or that it's not possible that it will set off this chain reaction of other problematic things to come if we if we support this idea if we vote a certain way if we make a certain change it doesn't mean that we're wrong but it is a logical fallacy that's called slippery slope okay so those are the logical fallacies i think there are 13 in total and there are a few of them again that have the same name so we have ad hominem and bag bandwagon we have either or and black white fallacy those are the same things we have skewed sample and texas sharpshooter but all in all i think we have 13 different fallacies and so those will be quizzed on this week, the quiz is open now. So there is no VBQ for this week that you need to do. Just go back and look through the fallacies. I will also post the slides for you to download and print and study if that's helpful for you. As always, if you have questions, um, you can let me know. You can just shoot me an email or send me a message through Canvas. Chapter eight in the Little Brown Handbook is also super helpful. So thank you for watching this lecture and I hope that you have a great week, thanks.